Okay, so it's a pleasure to have here today Matteo Bianchi. Matteo is currently associate professor at the Research Center Enrico Piaggio and the Department of Information Engineering at the University of Pisa. He's also a, a clinical research uh, affiliate at Mayo Clinic in uh, Rochester, USA. Uh, is co-chair of the RAS Technical Committee on Robot Hands Grasping and Manipulation and uh, also uh, the, the Chair for Information Dissemination of the RAS Technical Committee on Haptics. Uh, his research is about the design and development of haptics interfaces for, in particular, uh, human-machine and human-robot interaction and indeed today is going to talk about the interplay between model-based and data-driven approaches for modeling human sensory motor system. So, please. So, thanks, uh, uh, Nicoletta, for the nice introduction. Uh, also, thanks, uh, Francesca, for the nice invitation. I'm happy to be here to see uh, many friends, Lucia, and uh, to know uh, many interesting things about your research. So <clears throat> today I, I would like to discuss and uh, to present uh, some approaches for uh, modeling uh, human sensory motor system and uh, uh, more specifically the upper limb. And indeed it is not easy <coughs> to uh, consider and to model uh, upper limb. Uh, both uh, uh, if we consider the motor component, but also the sensory component, and actually the sensory motor component, because of course there are uh, many interplays and uh, uh, relationships between these two aspects. So my question <coughs> is uh, how to model this aspect uh, to translate them for designing robotic systems and uh, uh, interfaces for a human-robot uh, interaction. And as I said, since uh, uh, the motor component cannot exist without the sensory component and vice versa, it is also interesting to model the sense of touch. Indeed, in upper limb, uh, we have that if we consider the uh, fibers uh, for the control of the upper limb, uh, approximately 90% of these are afferent. So there is, there is a strong component in providing inputs uh, to the nervous system from the sensors that we have. And actually, it is not easy, of course, to model the sense of touch because uh, our skin is the largest organ that we have in our body. And as I said, there is a strong interplay with the motor component. And of course, it is not easy to take into account all these aspects. And this is a disclaimer. <coughs> Actually, I'm an engineer. And I'm not a neuroscientist. And I'm an, not an expert in machine learning, as, as you are, guys. So uh, this is just a disclaimer. Um, so I don't want to. Uh, provide uh, um, foundations of the neuroscience. But my research question are, uh, can we go from this to this? Okay, what we can learn from humans to build uh, robotic systems that behave like humans? And also to this, so if I want to uh, produce a sensing system for recording a human upper limb trajectories and eventually muscular activity, what can I learn from neuroscience? And another research question is, uh, how can I go from this, so human tactile experience and perception, to this, so uh, robotic uh, hands with uh, uh, advanced tactile capabilities for uh, doing and performing sensory motor tasks. And eventually, but unfortunately, there is no time. In haptic retargeting is a technique that enables haptic feedback for multiple virtual objects using a single physical prop. We leverage the dominance of human vision. It's uh, always like that. No, I... Haptic retargeting. <laughs> Yeah, how to use these uh, observations also for advancing uh, uh, human-machine interaction, for example, in uh, augmented reality. So this is the, the, my approach in brief. So of course, human behavior 
is a great source of inspiration. And what we can do is try to uh, look at nature and neuroscientific observations and translate this observation into a language that can be implemented in a, an artificial body and understood by an artificial body. And this is the, my, my, the, um, the picture of my approach. So moving, moving from neuroscience through mathematical modeling and, and then back uh, to humans uh, through system design. Using a model-based approach, but I will also show you that a data-driven approach uh, is uh, uh, extremely important in some cases. Uh, and I, I will uh, show you that in some cases we cannot prescind from a data-driven approach, uh, for example, in soft robotics. It's, it's very hard. OK, so this is the outline of, of, my, of my talk. So I will start from the neuroscientific foundation. And of course, if we look at our body, we um, can observe an um, um, amazing architecture with many bands, uh, ligaments, muscles, sensors. But we are lucky because uh, in neuroscience, uh, um, researchers uh, identify some mechanisms in human control that can produce commonalities in the uh, elemental variables that can be recruited for performing motor tasks. And these mechanisms can be generally defined with the term uh, synergies. So in brief, synergies uh, can be regarded as the coordination of elemental variables toward the execution of goal-directed actions. And these synergies have been studied at different levels, kinematic, muscular, neural, and so on. But what is in interesting uh, with, with this concept is that synergies can come with the concept of dimensionality reduction. And if you are a roboticist that you want to build a system or want to control a system, if you can find a reduced number of control inputs for your system, you can simplify the design and also the control of the system itself. Because basically, the idea uh, that uh, underpins the concept of synergy is that all the elemental variables of our body can be, in general, controlled according to uh, control schemes uh, in a subspace uh, whose dimensionality is uh, lower compared to the purely mechanical ones. And this idea, as you can imagine, uh, can have important implications in robotics for the design of under-actuated systems, so systems with a reduced number of actuators or control inputs, but also for the simplification of the control of uh, uh, robotic systems like manipulators and so on. And also in touch, uh, we can observe this kind of synergies. Uh, indeed, there is a, a well-known work uh, by Vincent Taylor where uh, the author tried to identify the dimensions needed to describe the haptic perception from a mechanical point of view. And of course, this number of dimension is very large. But our perception occurs in a low-dimensional space, so in, in three, four dimensional space. So our nervous system can produce reduction of the abundance of this tactile information to produce manageable representation. And also in this case, we can consider this simplification, these uh, uh, mechanisms of uh, um, to manage this abundancy as a, a something that we can use for designing interfaces that can interact with the human uh, in a meaningful way. And one of these mechanisms, <coughs> and uh, I, I will go uh, quickly, so is the tactile flow model. It's a model that we propose in, in PISA and basically is the haptic counterpart of uh, optic flow model. So if you imagine to uh, push your finger pad against an object, uh, so, uh, so you uh, can experience as a reaction force P, 
you can see, uh, you can imagine that uh, inside the, your finger pad, uh, there are some isostrain surface. And when you continue pushing the finger and the resultant force increase from P to P plus delta P, you can imagine that your isostrain surface expands, like in vision, uh, like in vision when you consider the iso brightness contours expansion when you want to compute the time to contact paradigm. And you can describe this flow of isostrain surface using an analogous model to the uh, optic flow model by Orn and Schunk. And as in uh, vision, uh, it's interesting because uh, the constraint equation of the flow is, is ill-posed. So you can experience the same aperture problem that you can see in vision, for example, for the barber pole. So if you uh, touch a surface with gratings, uh, you experience a direction of motion which, which is always perpendicular to the, to the direction of gratings. And we have also study with a colleague of mine, Alessandro Moscatelli, how this illusion can be integrated uh, and this perce tactile perception can be integrated with uh, human muscle skeletal uh, proprioceptive inputs in controlling and movement. So what I want to, to, to say is that there is an analogous model with respect to the optic flow for touch. And what I want to uh, present here is, for example, if we apply, we compute the divergence of this flow, and of course using Green theorem we can relate uh, the divergence of this flow over a contact area to the derivative of the contact area with respect to force, and you imagine to push against a soft surface, in that case the growth of the contact area will be greater uh, compared to the uh, stiffer uh, surface because uh, there will be, as you can see here, you can see that the softer surface will uh, um, encompass all the finger pad. So the growth of the contact area, uh, if we consider the same indenting force, will be greater with the softer object. And this is what uh, we used for designing <coughs> some uh, interfaces for softness rendering, but this is a work, an ongoing collaboration that we have with the University of Bristol with the Dr. Uh, Nathan Lepra. Uh, in this uh, uh, university at Bristol, they developed this uh, sensor here, which is a soft optical sensor using a camera. It can record the uh, displacement and the movement of these pins that uh, uh, can simulate some uh, biological structure in the, in the human finger pad. And uh, if we compute, for example, the uh, divergence of the optic flow of these uh, uh, pins, which can be regarded as uh, a proxy of the tactile flow, we can use this rate of expansion to discriminate between a soft object versus a rigid object. And as you can see here, uh, there is the magnitude and the direction of the flow for the stiff and the soft object. So this is just uh, to, to mention that we can use model-based approaches also in this case for, uh, the, for um, the, the managing of uh, soft optical sensors. But uh, what I, I would like to, to stress is uh, some applications in the, in the motor domain. So synergies can be used for designing systems with a reduced number of actuators and control inputs, but what can we do if we want to build system for sensing humans using a reduced number of sensors? And I will use a, a simple example. So let's imagine that we want to measure a two-dimensional variable with two components, x1 and, and x2. And let's imagine that a simple linear model. So 
the uh, y is the measurement of x1, of x2, for example, and uh, the, the measurement is related to the vector that we would like to estimate, but we have only one measurement corrupted by noise. So in this case, if we have only one measurement, all the solution that belongs that belong to the uh, null space of the measurement matrix H are valid under a mathematical point of view. But if we know that there is a prior distribution of X, we can try to fuse this prior distribution with the measurements. And uh, this fusion can, can be performed by knowing the prior covariance matrix of uh, X and the mean of this distribution. And as you can see, we can complement the estimation by properly parameterizing the new space of matrix, matrix H. So we can get a solution which is not only mathematical valid, but it, it is also reasonable under a natural point of view. And this is what we did, considering uh, the problem of uh, reconstructing and posture when only limited the number of sensors was available for grasping task. And in that case, the model is the same. So Y uh, represents the measurement, and uh, H is the measurement matrix, X is the state, so the joints that I would like to estimate. And in this case, <coughs> we use the uh, covariance matrix that uh, was used in a, in a work performed by uh, Santello and colleague in 1998, where uh, the authors recorded a large number of grasping posters, and uh, they considered the joints, recorded the joints, and computed the covariance matrix. And what we did next was, okay, I can complement my measurements if I have a limited number of sensor information. But the next problem is, if I have to design a system to reconstruct the hand postures, so if I have to determine the measurement matrix H, where I should place the sensor to increase the information on the actual posture? And in this case, we consider the a posterior a posterior covariance matrix P, uh, P P, which is a measurement of the amount of information that the observable variables carry about unknown parameters, and we design an optimization problem. So in our problem, we wanted to minimize a norm of this uh, a posteriori covariance matrix and the argument of this minimization was the measurement matrix H. And this is what we found. So we found that measurement uh, by measuring only five uh, joint and using the prior distribution that I mentioned, the one uh, recorded by Santello and colleague regarding grasping postures, we were able to complete the reconstruction according to a kinematic model uh, with uh, uh, 19 degrees of freedom. And we also built this glove, which is the technical implementation of this theoretical observation using kneaded piezo-resistive fabric sensors. So with only five sensors, we were able to reconstruct the posture according to uh, 19 degrees of freedom. So this is uh, um, something that was done considering the human hand. So synergies that uh, have been studied in depth for grasping tasks have been used to design robotic hand with a reduced number of degrees of freedom, but can be also used to uh, design a sensing system with a reduced number of sensors, which can be optimized considering the distribution of on the most probable postures in the human hands. And this is true for, for uh, 
for grasping task, but what about sensing human upper limb? So, oh, yeah. Yeah, we we optimized uh, what they measured, and uh, we did uh, some uh, assumption on the me on matrix H. So, matrix H uh, could be um, a matrix uh, that provides uh, has measurement a combination of the degrees of freedom that I want to estimate, or can be a selection matrix. So, in, in that case. Uh, um, in, in the case that I show, show you, we imposed that the matrix H was a selection matrix because for uh, the implementation is easier, even if under a theoretical point of view, matrix H can be uh, even as a, sorry? It can be a lot of other yeah, yeah, it can be also um, a continuous matrix, uh, not only selection matrix, and here also hybrid. And uh, in this case, we implemented this problem where we minimized the um, square of the Frobenius uh, norm of the uh, a posteriori covariance matrix because it is related with the trace of the matrix. So we implemented the gradient method for the minimization of this function. And uh, we used two custom functions. One was the minimization of the a posteriori covariance matrix in H. And the other one is was another cost function that uh, uh, forced the entries of the, of the matrix H to be the entries uh, of uh, a selection matrix. So it, 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 it was a method that we derived from PAPAS for the theory of graphs. And in that case, in the end, what we get was that a specific sensor corresponded to a specific joint to measure for the implementation. But of course, in general, it can be uh, also a continuous, a combination of the different degrees of freedom. Exactly. Yeah, so we found, yeah, this is, uh, this is important because, of course, this is an interesting question also, because, of course, it depends on the prior information. So the prior information that we chose was, um, it's a, a set of uh, seven, uh, 70, no, five, uh, 57 grasping poster. So in, in that case, uh, we consider the covariance matrix of, the joints angle according to this kinematic model which had 15 degrees of freedom that we complemented. Uh, and in that case, uh, we found in our optimization problem, we wanted to find the matrix H that minimized the a posteriori covariance matrix. And we found that the um, most uh, important, the most informative joints were the uh, thumb abduction and also the um, middle metacarpophalangeal joint, this one, and also uh, the, the ringer, um, the ringer uh, flexion joint uh, for the interphalangeal uh, part, and also two joints of the, of the little. And, and the, the, the fact that you, uh, you mentioned it, it's indeed true because uh, there is also a strong relationship between the middle and the index. So we can recover the index from, from the middle. And this is true under a mathematical point of view, but there are also observation of some biomechanical structure within, within the hand. So it was, uh, it was uh, interesting because this is uh, a, a method based on covariance uh, 
uh, on the, the estimation of the covariance matrix, but uh, it is based on some biomechanical principle. Yeah, and, and this was done for <coughs> the, uh, the the computation of uh, the posture for static grasping tasks. But uh, the challenge uh, is now to sense human biomechanics on the upper limb. So we um, um, there are there is an increasing interest in sensing not only the kinematic component but also the muscular component, also to derive. Uh, model regarding fatigue or uh, some model regarding uh, the effect of non-ergonomic postures on uh, uh, human users. And usually in literature there are interesting solutions for uh, the design of this sensing system and also as, as uh, uh, we discussed there is uh, the request for solutions that are not uh, obtrusive. And so they, they sh should be ideally wearable without uh, impairing uh, human motion and uh, m minimizing discomfort. And for this reason, it's also important to reduce the number of sensors. But in this case, we cannot use our approach in a straightforward manner because in, in, in the approach that I show you, we use uh, an, an a priori information on static postures and it is not uh, straightforward to apply to the estimation of temporal series. And also, we cannot uh, use the, the method that I presented for the uh, simultaneous reconstruction of multimodal data, because if I want to reconstruct joint angles and EMG, so electromyographic activity, it's uh, not easy to get a reliable estimation of the covariance matrix. And if we want to apply, apply this method to the upper limb, <coughs> what we proposed in, in, uh, was to uh, leverage the concept of the existence of covariation patterns in the human upper limb motions and the application of functional analysis. So for the first point, uh, what we did uh, was to demonstrate that there is uh, a dimensionality reduction also for human upper limb kinematics. So we recorded the data set of uh, motion of uh, um, human upper limb joint, and we computed both the principal component analysis on the mean uh, entry of the data set, and we found that the first three principal component uh, uh, together allowed to explain more than the 80% of the, of the variability of the data set. And also we verify the stability of this description and we apply uh, time varying synergy. So frame by frame, we apply principal component analysis. So we, we define this repeated PCA because in this case we can still comply with the requirements of principal component analysis. Exactly, exactly. In the previous case, we applied PCA on the mean entry for the trajectory. And in this case, frame by frame, we applied PCA. And uh, each time we computed the distance between the subspace identified by the first three principal component and this uh, static principal component that we computed on the mean entry of the data set. And what we found was that uh, th th there is um, still a good variability explained by these uh, three first principal components. And an interesting point was that even if uh, each pr singular principal component was different, the, the, the distance between the subspace explained by the first three principal component frame by frame and the, the, the subspace defined on the static on the static uh, uh, computation was uh, the distance was very small so uh, we observed that uh, the subspace described by the first three principal component together was almost invariant during 
the movement phase, even if there is a higher variability during the contact, as we explained. But this was an observation that we use. So we, we can rely on uh, covariation schemes during the, mo the, um, the um, movement phase that can be used eventually for the reduction of uh, the sensory inputs that I would like to use for the reconstruction of the time series. So from this observation, <laughs> the next step was the application of the functional analysis. So basically, the functional principal component analysis is a functional extension of the principal component analysis. So in the principal component analysis, I want to find the eigenvector the first again vector that maximizes the variability, the variance explained along the direction, and the other again vectors of the a priori covariance matrix maximize the variance along orthogonal direction and so on. And this is the same in the functional domain. In this case, we can consider the time evolu the temporal evolution of each joint, for example. And uh, we can identify a basis that can be Fourier basis or spline and so on. And the combination of this basis uh, can be used for the reconstruction of the movement. And then we can compute the principal component analysis on the coefficient that can be used for combining these basis elements. And it is the same. So in this case, the first functional principal component is the function for which we maximize the score, and the second uh, is, is uh, uh, the same, but with a uh, constraint on orthogonality, and so on. So we can identify these principal modes of variation for each joints. And in the human upper limb, we have this basis on function that can be ordered based on the, on the variance that can be regarded as modulants of the motions plus a mean trajectory. And also in this case, we can order this uh, functional basis uh, in, uh, according to a, a hierarchy of uh, uh, variants explained. So this is what we use, so the two key ingredients. So the existence of covariation schemes and the functional uh, principal component analysis. So, what, what we did, imagine that we have uh, some joints that we want to measure over time and muscle that we want to measure over time. And we can identify three phases. So an encoding phase, an estimation phase, and a decoding phase. So basically, in the encoding phase, we want to use a functional principal component analysis to identify a basis of function. Of course, the combination of this basis can approximate any generic joint and the MG signal temporal evolution. And as I said, the we identified the coefficient of the decomposition according to this basis. And the, the coefficients of this decomposition or weights that can be extracted from an a priori data set can be organized together with the average trajectories to form an extended state space vector. Why? Because in, in this way, a novel motion, when we perform a novel motion, we can encode it through the basis of functional principal component. And also, we have uh, uh, this extended space uh, represented by the average trajectory and coefficients. So we can apply the approach that I show you for static posture, because in this case, we have no the temporal component, there are only weights. So we can use minimum variance estimation to estimate all the components of the state corresponding to all the, the joint and the MG recorded uh, for the upper limb, even when some of these cannot be directly measured. And then <clears throat> in the decoding procedure, we can apply uh, this this uh, this phase to reconstruct the motion of the whole upper limb joints. Of course, in this case, we have just to combining to combine the functional principal components with the estimated extended state. And 
this is what I, 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 I mentioned, I presented. So a, a generic sig signal can be decomposed as a weighted sum of an average uh, trajectory plus a weighted sum of the basis element of or functional principal component. Um, yeah, this is uh, of course if we want to collect all the weights in a in a in a given matrix, but it's the analogous uh, which uh, is an ana uh, it's a, uh, something completely similar to what I mentioned before. And this is what uh, I said. So we have this extended state with the average trajectory and the weights of the functional principal component decomposition. And here we can directly apply what I showed you before for the static posture. So we imagine to measure some of these joints. Of course, in this case, matrix H is a block matrix because we want to, measure, to uh, record each time after the encoding phase the average trajectory and the coefficient. So it, it, it depends on the number of basis elements that we want to enroll to uh, improve the reconstruction accuracy. And we can apply the same approach. So using the covariance matrix of this uh, priori data set, the computation of the posteriori matrix, and so on. So in our case, this is the, 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 the problem that we would like to Minimize. So we would like to minimize the uh, posteriori covariance matrix with H as the argument of the minima. In this case, uh, we consider the uh, as a norm the shutter norm because we wanted uh, to minimize the uncertainty of the estimation in the worst case, and we use a genetic algorithm to minimize uh, this function. And this is what we did. So we implemented this method for considering a data set of 30 uh, um, actions. So intransitive without any object, transitive uh, and tool mediated with objects, uh, recorded from 20 healthy subjects. And we split the data set in 70% for prior and 30% for testing. And also in the data set, we have the recording of the muscular activity. And in this case, we have a Gaussian noise with the standard deviation of 0.1 uh, radians for joints and uh, uh, with the standard deviation uh, of uh, 10 at minus 2 millivolt for muscles. And the Minimization of the a posteriori covariance matrix uh, led to the definition of this measurement. So the most informative measurement for a, um, the reconstruction of the human upper limb kinematic and for the recording of the muscles are this one that I have uh, highlighted in these pictures. Because of course the muscular and the kinematic component are strongly related to each other, and as you can see here, <coughs> we have a good reconstruction of uh, the joints and also of the of the muscular activity. This is the um, the um, error, the average error that we get for the reconstruction of the joints trajectories and the reconstruction of the millivolt of the uh, muscular uh, profiles over time. And in this case, we can reduce the number of uh, the quantities that I have to record. So we'll uh, skip <coughs> briefly this, this part, because we can also use these results if I want to implement a human-like motion planning. Because, of course, if I want to implement human-like motion planning, there are many uh, um, hypotheses, uh, like a minimum jerk, minimum joint torque, and so on. But in this case, since we have a basis of function that can approximate human movement at the joint level, I can use these elements to generate arbitrary movements without any assumption that I have to do, but using this observation. And this is the problem for point-to-point -point free motion for human-like motion planning. So in this case, 
if I want to move from point A to point B, the trajectory is constrained to be a combination of the static configuration, Q square, Q, Q square, plus the time series S0, which is defined as the average trajectory of the recorded data set. And then we have a combination of the principal functional mode that I identify with uh, uh, the human example. And of course, I can enroll more elements if I want to get uh, more precise results. And in this case, the problem has a solution in close form, even using one functional principal component plus the mean function. But uh, we can also did something more interesting. So I want to move from point A to point B at the joint level, but I want to avoid some obstacles. And in this case, we can, uh, of course, find a, a solution to this problem. So minimize the motion from point A plus, uh, to point B, and also with the potential base cost function to avoid the obstacles. And in this case, we can obtain a problem through a numerical solution, and we can in increase the number of uh, functions to be enrolled to um, find the solution and also to improve the precision. And this is what we did in simulation. Uh, as you can see, we can get a very low jerk value, and uh, we have uh, um, bell-shaped velocity, velocity profile, no, we cannot see any. Uh, okay. Ah, okay. But of course, in this case, everything works if I assume that my robot has the same kinematic of the human that I used to extract the, the, the functional modes. And this is not the case. So if I want to use this result for a, a generic manipulator, I have to implement a planning, a, a mapping strategies from the human example to the robotic control. So in this case, what we did is to implement an impedance control at the Cartesian level to the end effector of the paradigmatic model that I use for the description of the kinematic data for humans with the kinematic model of my robot. And in this case, the torque provided to the robot include the term that compensate the dynamics of the robot, then it's an inertia, Coriolis and gravity contribution. And also we have a term that have to minimize the error and its derivative between the actual robot and the factor and the endpoint of the model that we use for studying and for planning the motions with the human data. And we, we implemented also a second impedance control, and this second Cartesian impedance control is uh, to minimize the distance between the elbow of the robot and the planet motion at the elbow level, so to uh, handle redundancy. And it is important uh, that uh, to notice that uh, to keep the effects of the control uncoupled, we projected the second controller in the new space of the first one. And this is what we, we get. As you can see, <coughs> we have uh, a good uh, value of uh, the jerk. And in this case, uh, I have not to do any assumption, any uh, learning, because I can use the functions of humans and directly uh, map uh, these functions f in the control of uh, a robotic manipulator. Now, our next step is to uh, work directly at the Cartesian domain. But uh, it is important uh, also, if I want to put the motor and the sensory domain together, to use data-driven methods. They, they are extremely important, for example, for soft manipulation. So now, as you can see here, there is a, a soft robot in hand, the hand that can deform with the environment, that can be soft articulated or they can be continuously deformable with respect to the environment. 
And in this case, so this is what I studied when I started the study in robotics. So we have rigid ends with the rigid phalanxes. So you can measure exactly the, the point with the joints uh, using encoder, and you can find analytical solutions. So you can hypothesize a set of available contact point why their position and contact forces can be evaluated from object knowledge. But this is no more the case, because if I have a hand that can deform continuously with the environment, this analytical solution cannot be applied as we knew. So what we can do was to use a data-driven approach and using a distributed intelligence approach. So this, this is the pyramid that uh, we envision. So we have the, the, the highest level, which is a, a high level computation. So we can use a deep neural network to predict the strategy that a human can use for grasping an object. A medium level implementation, so a set of human inspired low level strategies for the approaching and also the sensory trigger the reaction. And then we have the, the lowest level, but not because it's not important, because it's the level on which we can capitalize for implementing the other, which is the embodied intelligence. So for example, here we have the PISA IIT soft tent, which is a hand with only one motor, but 19 degrees of freedom. So the hand can be controlled using only one motor, but uh, and in the free hand motion, the movement is constrained along the first most probable grasping posture of humans, but it can deform with the environment. So it can adapt with the environment to multiply the grasping capabilities. And, the, and uh, this inspiration can be considered uh, to take uh, this uh, distributed intelligence problem. So the intelligence is not only in the computation, but it's also in the mechanics and so on. So what we did was uh, we implemented the deep classifier. Basically, we collected uh, some primitive of human grasping, uh, and we labeled this primitive. And, and then uh, from a, a RGB frame, uh, from the first frame of each video showing only the object in the environment, uh, we have uh, uh, first, uh, a first part using simply YOLO for the object detection. And then we have, uh, once we have these uh, uh, bounding boxes of, of the object, uh, we have uh, um, the, the other part which was based, uh, which was built upon inception. So in, in this case, using a, a transfer learning approach, so basically we uh, kept the early and the middle layers of the inception and uh, uh, we removed the, the softmax layer, but uh, it, 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 we added uh, two fully connected layers uh, which uh, uh, apply adaptive nonlinear combination of the high level features that we discover using convolutional and pulley layer. And then with the softmax, we have the, 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 the probability distribution over the set of most probable primitives that human can perform to grasp a given object. Okay, we skip this part, but uh, uh, of course this is uh, the, uh, if I see the object, I can move like uh, a human if I want to behave in a human-like way in a word thought for humans with uh, human inspired robotic hands. But uh, humans, uh, um, basically, in our action, we mainly go in feed forward, and then we have sensory triggered uh, feedback at, uh, at, the, at the tactile mechanoreceptors. So <clears throat> this is what we did. So uh, we implemented the approaching phase by, using, uh, uh, by identifying the set of primitives from the human data set, and we implemented this primitive using the planning with the functional principal component analysis. But then when the, the hand contacted the object, this primitive should be complemented with the reactive part. And it is important to note that 
the, with the soft end, they have an intrinsic adaptability. So since they adapt with the object, uh, what is really needed is only a definition of the pose of the hand, so the control of the wrist. And this is what uh, uh, we did. So we endowed our soft hand with the IMUs on the fingernail, and uh, we recorded uh, the uh, contact with uh, an object, a single object placed on a pole, and we related the acceleration profile with the wrist orientation. And in this way, we identify a set of 13 primitives, which is a good trade-off between uh, exhaustiveness and, uh, um, is, uh, and the capability of implementation. And this is what uh, uh, was used to close the approaching primitive. So once the object was contacted, we have this uh, reactive phase. And this is, these are some of the primitives that we identify and we implemented. So, um, as you can see, the, the primitive uh, that we get uh, were typically uh, a human-like motion. But it is interesting that this hand can no only do power grasp. But you, if you use the environment, you can also perform a pinch grasp, as you can see from this video. And these are the, the video that I love more, because if we want to uh, grasp an object, what, uh, like a, 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 a dish or something very, very thin, what we do is to put it on the, on, on the edge and then to grasp it. And <clears throat> this is what we did. So we extensively tested uh, this uh, uh, architecture with uh, uh, 100 uh, uh, 11 grasps, and we get uh, an accuracy in performing the grasp uh, over uh, larger than 80%. And in the, in the last minute, uh, I would like just to, to show you another, another aspect, because of course we can say, okay, we, uh, we solve everything, but of course we, we, do, we have many problems. And of course, if you grasp something, uh, this can, so it happens sometimes, very often, no, sometimes that the object uh, can fail, can fall from the hand. And what, what could be interesting was to have a prediction of the failure in order to trigger a reactive action. And usually in robotics, there are strategies for grasp failure detection if I directly measure contact forces with, with the sensors and so on. But if I use soft robotic hand, it's not so easy to apply sensor, rigid sensor to the hand itself. So what we can try to do is to build and to learn end-to-hand -end mapping from raw sensor data to the, the failure e event. And this is true even if we look at uh, the human example. So if we tap over a table, we can see the spatial distribution of uh, vibrations, so mechanical way that uh, move very far from the original point of contact, uh, and that can be informative regarding the, the, the gesture and the action that uh, we can perform. So what we did was to use uh, a glove with the IMUs that was that we place over our hand and also uh, considering a soft continuum hand, which is a pneumatic one from the University of Berlin, but I would like to, to emphasize this, this aspect. And uh, we implement a recurrent neural network based on uh, gated recurrent units. And uh, basically, we uh, consider the acceleration and the velocity, the angular velocity from the IMU, and we use this uh, uh, implementation so to develop uh, an online feedback, feedback system. So this system takes as input the inference of the proposed recurrent neural network, which is the prediction of the sliding event and also the direction from the top or lateral, and selects a reactive regrasping primitive, which is performed by a second robotic arm-hand system. 
and this is what we get so we get a 75 percent correct prediction of the failure uh, failure direction uh, two seconds in advance uh, and 80 um, so we we get uh, an 80 I remember it was higher, so maybe the first one um, I just copied in the right one, but the second one I was, I'm true. So we get 85% successful regrasp if we consider a selection of 12 objects in common use. So this is uh, uh, something, some of these examples. So you can, uh, you can see from, from, from one hand we grasp an object and when the, the object uh, slides because uh, uh, we uh, we identified the sliding uh, and we selected the architecture that identified the sliding two seconds in advance. The other the other arm and the system moves to uh, block to stop the um, the sliding part and it depends if the the failure is along the vertical axis or lateral and in, in this case despite the fact that we train the network using only spherical and cylindrical objects we demonstrate a high generalization capabilities and we get a correct prediction of the failure direction in uh, um, yeah, in 80% of cases, okay, approximately. So, what, which, which is the, the, the lesson that we learn and, and what can be the next step? So, of course, as a, a roboticist and engineer in, in, in robotics, I would like to use model-based methods uh, to try to translate the neuroscientific observation from system design but especially in this new field uh, like uh, soft robotic manipulation and so on, it is uh, very, very important to integrate uh, data-driven uh, methods. Uh, and of course, uh, I think that uh, we can successfully integrate these two approaches also to take out some issues and challenges that we have to face. For example, the needs of data, that it is important for data-driven approach that uh, we, for example, here are some, uh, a couple of, of, uh, of papers that we recently uh, work on. For example, in this one, we use a, a convolutional neural network and a gated graph neural network uh, to, um, to learn with few examples the semantic description of novel human inspired grasp strategies from RGB data. Or, for example, this is a tool for labeling a video based on a taxonomy that we propose. But if we, uh, we can get the best from data-driven approach and the best of model-based approach to get, uh, I think, uh, a unique computational and implementation power that uh, uh, we have never experienced uh, before because now we have all the tools to, to, do, th to do this. And of course, <clears throat> I would like to thank uh, all uh, uh, my co-authors and, uh, um, yeah, and the funding uh, and of course I thank you. Thank you, Matteo, for the nice seminar. So, questions? Bye. Thank you very much for, for the seminar. So, I was wondering, at the very beginning, you um, started by saying that our brain has a low dimensional representation of posture, if I got it right. And I was wondering if you have um, an idea whether that depends on the goals that we have on, or on the degrees of freedom of our body, or both, or whether that's known. Yeah, this is a, <coughs> a nice question. So we, so um, in, in this, uh, it's a very simple, I try to 
So as I said, I'm not a neuroscientist, so I will try to, to give an explanation based on the application. So basically, we have uh, some constraints in the biomechanics of our body, and, and also some central constraints in our, in our brain. But it, we can do anything. We can play pl piano, we can play guitar. So if we use uh, this uh, um, description of uh, basis, uh, of uh, elements of basis, we can, of course, uh, uh, enroll a lower number of elements for some tasks, and we can increase the number of these elements for other tasks. And this is the flexibility of uh, our synergistic control that, for example, in some pathological condition is not because we have a fixed coupling, so we have not this uh, flexibility in the enrollment. But, for example, in grasping tasks, we can see that uh, the, the, the two, three first principal component of uh, the, the, the most probable distribution of grasping can explain over the 90% the, the of, the, of the variance. So in that case, we can uh, benefit from this uh, low dimensional description. But of course, uh, I can do anything with, 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 the, with, the, with the hand. Yeah, exactly. So the follow-up is if uh, the correct representation depends on both your physical mechanical constraints and the task is because my sense from what you described is that you separated the problem in first a good representation, so a representation that um, minimizes errors uh, with respect to the actual posture, and then you applied this representation to different tasks. Maybe I didn't get it right, because I, I'm wondering if there is a way to close the loop and, and just updating your representation based on the task, because clearly what you just said is that Exactly, exactly, because as I said, all, all, all uh, the things that I <coughs> presented depends on the prior, prior distribution. And for example, in grasping tasks, uh, it's the, the, the posture that we consider are quite good and representative. And also in the upper limb motion phase, uh, we have this we identify this motion with the neuroscientists in order to cover all the possible range of motion of, of the kinematics of the human upper limb. But of course, it depends on the prior, because with the um, prior distribution on the grasping task, I can never um, predict this or not this, because I have covariance for the goal-directed tasks. I think that uh, um, the, 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 the ideal case should be to, to find uh, um, an exhaustive prior distribution, but it is not true, because otherwise if it's so exhaustive for everything, it is meaningful. It cannot, be, um, it cannot provide uh, any meaningful uh, uh, information or update eventually the information or eventually we can try to complement this model-based method with uh, other methods that can be more uh, driven by, by, by data without uh, having assumptions on the covariation part. But yes, it's, tr it's true. These are goal-directed actions. So if I can have motion of the upper limb, uh, but for example, for grasping, it's true because uh, I have this for grasping, but uh, I cannot predict this one. But there are studies, for example, where the synergies, the covariation schemes uh, using, used for the haptic exploration contain the grasping posture. So it, it, I can increase the cardinality. I can com complete the prior information, but of course, the, the trade-off is to complete and at the same time to, to get a, a good uh, amount uh, of uh, elements that can be representative in a, in a satisfactory way. So yeah, the, 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 it's, it's not easy, but we have to, to find this trade-off and also other methods can, can play a role. On, on the grasping part, the last one that you were discussing about the falling experiments. And, uh, 
So I missed the point where you were saying uh, what type of input you get from the objects you're about to grasp. So is there any understanding of the semantics of the object, of the geometry? Because, uh, yeah, of course, I, I think that yeah. the, there are different things that can be done, objects with handles, uh, yeah. objects of different weight. So I was <coughs> yeah, for, uh, wondering for if you can comment a bit on in this, uh, uh, For this uh, work uh, here, what we, um, we consider for example, so we have uh, um, so uh, we extracted uh, only um, like a very high level feature of, of the object, so the shape basically. So the, we didn't we did not uh, any uh, consideration about the weight, for example, and. <coughs> In, in what, what we, we we did was to uh, not to get a one-to-one -one signature of the object with the, the primitive, but based on uh, a semantic description, which is a high level, what we, we would like to um, associate a primitive to this uh, description, and. Uh, we are lucky, and here we can exploit the, soft, the softness of the hand because I can manage local uncertainties using the, the soft hand. So it, I think that uh, for soft robotic manipulation, it's, there is a good synergy between uh, uh, machine learning and deep learning and the mechanical design because they can help each other in this case. And in, the, in this other, for the for the um, for the uh, failure uh, in, in that case we only consider the um, acceleration and the velocity from from the IMU but we also recorded the position of the object and of course the position the joint position of the robot okay. could be interesting to, to have a look other questions? So I have one. Um, so as we discussed this morning, the, the act of grasping is also shaped by what comes after. So if I have to grasp a glass to drink, I will do probably like, like this. If I just want to move, I will probably do like this. So this is related with the goal as well. Uh, I was wondering how complex would it be to generalize all the things that you said, because you are only focusing on the, the, the grasp action per se, let's say, to incorporate also this additional uh, source of variability. So should it be related with uh, the, the number of connected, oh, sorry, principal components that is you are using? Yeah, this is a nice question, of course. Yeah, it depends. Uh, even if you want just to solve the grasping problem per se, it's, it's, it's not easy in robotics. But for example, I want to grasp an object for. So <clears throat> uh, with other colleagues, we, we work on a matrix for grasping su success, uh, which is uh, something that is uh, task oriented. So some, sometimes it's not, uh, if I want to pass you a hammer uh, as a robot, I have to pass it properly. So in that case, I think that uh, uh, we can, of course, increase uh, the dexterity of the robotic hand by implementing uh, more uh, uh, principal component, for example, to allow in a hand manipulation. But I think what is important is to correctly plan the phase for a task informed grasp. And this is uh, another part where the two aspects can work together. Thanks. Other questions? Otherwise, thanks again, Matteo. Thank you.